Thank you for the introduction. I am Santiago Alfaro from Intel Labs, and I'm here to talk to you about our project, Thin VR. Um, now, before we get into it, my lawyer has asked me to show this to you guys. I'll give you a minute. Uh, so, I'm kidding. Uh, so basically, what we want you to realize and, and take with you is that this is a research project, and this is pure research. This is not a corporate talk, so don't don't go home thinking anything about about Intel's futures or Intel um, uh, any products that Intel may have in the pipeline. This is just pure research that we've done with with my group. So we're here to talk about head-mounted displays. So first, let me talk to you a little bit about what the background was, what the problems we wanted to get to, and and the approach that we took. Um, so. Head-mounted displays have basically not changed in, in size since the 80s. And this is mostly due to physics. Um, there's the, the, there are certain constraints and limits that you can't get past. Uh, and these limits get even more noticeable once you try to do a wide field of view. Um, so as you can see in the, in the image on the right, this is, this is a wide field of view a uh, head-mounted display that is much larger uh, than the other one. Mm. So let's do a little background about this. So this is, the main thing here is what we call the focal length. And the focal length is the plane at which everything is gonna fall into focus for a particular lens. And there's a relation between the size of the lens and the length of that focal length, distance of that focal length. So the larger the lens, the larger the focal length. Um, so this is already constraining the size. But even worse, if you want to give a wide field of view, you have to use an even wider lens, which means even longer focal length. So then in the end, everything starts to grow with the lens. Uh, so our approach, which is something that has been tried before, is, well, why don't we use a lot of small lenses? Each one of those lenses is going to have a small focal length. And then we deal with whatever comes later. Um, and this is what we did. So we, we created an array of smaller lenses. We, we uh, reduce the focal length, uh, and then now this is the kind of things that we had to deal with um, afterwards. So the first one of these is, as you can see in the image on the left, lenses are made to be seen through the central axis, or many lenses. So if we just take that one lens and repeat it up and down, by the time you get to the extreme lenses, you are looking at that lens through a much uh, different angle than the central axis. So anything that you see through that lens is going to be distorted and it's not going to look well. So our first task was we need to create a column of lenses where every single lens is a little different and every single lens is optimized for that specific angle of incidence. So we end up with a heterogeneous lens lens um, that we can actually re uh, reproduce in an array. Now, because we start with a column, and then we can actually, we were going to repeat that column, but in order to give the field of view, we can actually create, uh, re repeat that column in a curve that is concentric with your eye. So now we have a curved lens array. And if we add to that a curved display, and then one of those per eye, then we can give you a stereo view with a wide field of view. So this was our basic idea. Uh, now, if you're thinking, there's um, how do, how does it look like? Can you actually get a good image if you're looking through a many 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 lenses? Um, so in this video, this is a DSLR on a stage looking through uh, our prototype. This is the the actual curved array and the actual curved screen. So you can see how once the camera gets to the right point, the um, the image fuses and the image becomes coherent. So this area where the DSLR is right now, it's called the eye box. And as long as you're inside this eye box, the image is gonna look correct. So what we have now, this is the uh, horizontal, we're moving the camera horizontally and vertically in order to create, to test the size of this eye box. So as I was saying, as long as you stay within the eye box, the image is not gonna break. And you can see here, there are some small uh, issues uh, but overall, the image is very coherent and it's, and it's overall fused. So this proves that our approach is actually valid, that you can, you can take a lens array and you can create a, a coherent image that looks, that looks great. So 
here is an animation of basically how we did the whole thing. We created an array, we repeated the lenses, we put a, a curved display behind it, and then we used this model to create our prototype. So we made two prototypes in this. We made an, a static prototype and a dynamic prototype. Um, with the static prototype, we were able to um, look at all of the uh, problems we were going to have in, of building this thing and not have to deal with the display. And then with the dynamic prototype, we were going to be able to do some other things like moving and creating a, a, a full panorama. So if we start with a static prototype, um, the as I was saying, the first thing we need to do is figure out what are the minimum things that we cannot change. So there's two things we can change. We can change the human factor. So we had to we had to understand uh, the interpupillary distances. We had to understand head sizes, nose sizes, um, and everything in between. So even just in between my my coworkers, I had to build something that would adapt to a 50 millimeter distance between the eyes to a 70 millimeter distance between the eyes, and everything in between. And then not only that, but even if somebody has a small uh, IPD. That doesn't mean that the head that, that the head is also the smaller. So you have to deal with differences in all of these in, in all of these uh, sizes. And on the other side, we have um, mechanical things that we can't change. So once the array, once the lens array is made, I can't change the size of the lens array. Uh, I can't change the size of the screen that we were going to use in the end. So everything had to um, adapt uh, properly, and everything had to work work in in coherent with it, with each other. Um, so once everything is established um, and we have and all of the parts are manufactured, uh, in optics alignment is very very important, and any tiny deviation from the proper alignment is going to break the image. But not only that, but um, there's always going to be a difference between your simulation and your CAD model and the actual manufactured piece. So even if everything works in your computer. Once you get the manufactured lenses and once you get the manufactured uh, components, things are not going to be the exact same. So my prototype had to be able to adjust every little um, angle, X, Y, and Z of almost every element with, it, with relation to each other. I have to be able to locate the lenses in front of the eye properly. I have to be able to locate the, the screen with respect to the lens. Each one of those viewfinders between uh, with each other, and then the whole device around your face, everything had to move. This makes the rig to be bigger than it is because it needed a lot of knobs. But slowly, as we um, as we hone down the particulars of of this uh, manufactured device, then everything starts to shrink again. Another one of the problems that we had to deal with is a backlight. We don't have a curved backlight, so. There's two ways that I went about this. One was I laser cut and laser etched a acrylic cylinder uh, that then I could illuminate from the side with an LED strip. Now the LED strip would uh, make the light travel through the acrylic and come and come out forward. This gives us a very strong backlight, but I was not able to make it very uniform. So the difference in illumination level between one side and the other was noticeable. So then I went with an electroluminescent, electroluminescent panel that you can cut uh, to the size you want, uh, which gives us a very, very uniform illumination, but it's not very strong. So for the final prototype, we actually did, did go with the electroluminescent panel, and we just were smart about what kind of scene and content we were going to show. Um, so you can see this is the uh, final static prototype. It's using the the EL panel. You can see the image behind the lenses. Of course, everything is distorted because we're not in the eye box, but uh, you can see the overall size of this. Uh, and in the bottom, you can see uh, what the DSLR camera looks through the device. So uh, this is using a, a printed film that is 2032 drops per inch which is very high resolution, much higher than any screen that we could have found. So it's good to see uh, what a future head-mounted display with extreme resolution would look like. And you can see how it's a very uh, stable fused image that looks, uh, that looks pretty nice. Um, the other thing we could do with, the, with our static prototype is we wanted to compare, like, well, let's do an apples to apples, how much 
did we actually gain in form factor? Like we know we have the, the wide field of view. So we got a Pimax 5K, one of the best um, head-mounted displays that is offering 180 degrees out in the market. Uh, and initially it looks much bigger, but in order to make a fair comparison, we took, we got, I got rid of the casing, I got rid of the electronics, and I, I tore it down to its bare minimum optical elements, basically lens, screens, and the distance you needed between. And then I did the same to ours. So it, I was actually very impressed how small uh, the Pimax is, but even with that, our thin VR uh, got a reduction in size of around 50%. Um, it also turns out, just so you know, doing this to your Pimax will void your warranty. Uh, now for the dynamic prototype. Uh, so I had mentioned the dynamic prototype, the biggest problem was the um, the curved screen, like how are we gonna get this? So we know uh, that some cell phones have a curved OLED inside them. And the trick is not only to get the screen separated from the phone, but you have to also get the screen separated from the glass in front of it, which is they use some very powerful adhesives for, for this. So there's a couple of ways to do this. You can use heat, you can use cold, uh, you can use uh, dry ice. Um, so we started practicing that we started testing with different phones and uh, S6, S8, S9. As the phone got, as the generation got um, later, we actually had more and more and more trouble. So it turns out that they were improving their adhesive, I guess. Uh, so we actually at the end had to go to a third party where they would use extreme cold uh, so that the adhesive would become brittle and we could separate the screen without uh, damaging the phone. Um, and also worth to mention, this again voids your warranty, but you know we do it for science. Um, now the thing about using a cell phone screen is that there is no way to power or to drive the screen without actually using the phone. So we're stuck with the phone. So any kind of testing of the testing rig, as you can see right here, everything we have we have a little testing uh, prototype, but we have to account for the uh, phone gots to be close by, which means that by the time I want to make this into a head-mounted display that I can actually grab with my hands and put on my face, I still need to account for the cell phone. So this is, again, a much larger um, a prototype than it would be if we actually had our proprietary screens or, and everything we needed. But now the good thing is we still have access to everything the phone has, like the camera, the sensors, the accelerometers, everything like that. So uh, when you look here, the final dynamic prototype on a Lazy Susan, which like, honestly, it's, it's pretty much just a stool. Uh, but we put the here, you can see how as the, as the Lazy Susan rotates, the image can respond to the gyroscope on the phone and we actually get a, um, Gets get get um, uh, get movement on the on the scene, and then in the other video you can see how from within again with a DSLR camera in the eye box, and this is just this is not the phone moving but the screen well the image in the screen moving and you can see how even that movement creates very little um, artifacts and everything is still a very fused very coherent image. So this final prototype was a, was made with two Galaxy S9 phones using those flexible OLED screens. Um, uh, the S9 is uh, 2960 by 1440 pixels, which gives us uh, 570 pixels per inch uh, per eye. So um, to wrap it up, what, we, what, what, what I want you guys to remember is we are the first people to actually be able to prove in the same device two things. We were able to do a wide field, 180 degree field of view, uh, while still maintaining and even reducing the form factor from anything that's out there in the market. So those two things we did uh, simultaneously. I think we have also proven that the approach works, that you can take those lenslets and make a coherent image and make a good experience. Um, there are some small um, problems that are left over, but we are very confident that with, an, with enough uh, investment, monetary, time-wise effort, uh, we actually can overcome any of the issues that are left. Uh, I'm also very happy to mention that we won one of the uh, best paper awards from the IEEE Virtual Reality 
conference uh, this year. Um, we're very happy about this. And if anybody is interested, the, you can feel free to check out this paper. It's very, it's much more complete. It talks about anything that I actually didn't get into this um, on this talk. I want to talk about my contribution particularly, but if you want to know about the rendering pipeline, if you want to know about the technology, the optics, everything is covered in that paper. Uh, feel free to you just Google Thin VR. You should be able to get a paper that you can download. Um, so that being it, um, I'm very happy to take any of your questions. So thank you very much. Santiago, Santiago, what a great insight to the research project of the new thin and wide field of view VR display. Very nice. Uh, some questions, um, obviously. Um, uh, when is it available? Um, so remember, this is a um, this is basically a research project. So this mm -hmm. we're, we're not we're not tied in any way to to future productization from Intel or anything like that. Um, we've taken it as far as we feel we want to take it in terms of uh, the questions that we had and in terms mm -hmm. of proving that the approach works. Uh, from then on, we'll, we're open to talk if anybody is interested in, in tackling the, the rest of the issues. Um, will, you can feel free to ping me after, after the talk. Yeah. Now, the se second thing uh, that comes to mind is, uh, uh, is there um, any um, dramatic uh, change on the price point or uh, the cost um, uh, producing this kind of uh, display compared to the uh, traditional one? Um, so we didn't get to the point of making a, a cost analysis for this project. Uh, we were more, more interested in the, in the design and research. Um, there, in terms of where it is today, uh, just, the, just our prototype, there would be some cost reduction when we, if we were able to uh, mass produce the lenses, for example, and get, it, and get into that research. Uh, but I wouldn't have any, any proper comparison with any um, with anything that's out there right now. And there wouldn't be a way to make a fair comparison either. Okay. Then um, a last question uh, that we can cover here. Uh, uh, Dimitri Schmunk asks, will there be, uh, will the addition of eye tracking to this design um, help with relaxing optical design restrictions and increasing an uh, eye box? Oh, well, okay, so yes, there are some um, head-mounted displays that have used um, eye tracking in order to, to, to increase their performance. Um, the, and it would definitely work for thin VR. We could use some eye tracking. And one of the interesting things that we could do is that uh, because you would be tracking dynamically, you could actually make the eye box a little smaller, but that would increase the spatial resolution and just in general make a much better, a much better display. Yeah. Okay, uh, we need to cut um, the Q&A at this point of time and continue uh, with the track. So uh, thank you again, Santiago. Thank you. Thank uh, you very uh, much, Anthony. Yeah.